Okay, so let's talk about that thing that cows make that just piles up. And you know what? It's also something that just used to flow out of my college roommate's mouth and. Oh, bull whip. We're talking about bull whip. My bad. So a hypothetical scenario, imagine that you sell toilet paper and for some weird reason, people are just buying a whole bunch of toilet paper and you're thinking, awesome, I'm gonna make even more toilet paper. You start expanding your business, maybe hiring more toilet paper makers and buying more paper to make, I don't know what goes into it, but you're making more. And then all of a sudden, for some weird reason, no one's really buying it like they used to. Now I know this probably wouldn't happen, but that's kind of an example of the bullwhip effect. And it can kind of go both ways where you overproduce, thinking that everyone wants it, and all of a sudden you have this massive leftover, or on the other end of that, it's kind of like Christmas time, 1985, and Teddy Ruxpin is wildly popular, and you're pretty sure your parents are gonna get you one for Christmas, and then they don't. Um, didn't happen, it didn't happen to me. I'm just saying it could have happened to people. Where, you, you know, now your customers want a whole bunch of the thing you might have made, and you don't have enough to give it to them because there's the whole supply chain, right? So that whole process is called the bullwhip effect, because it goes through your whole supply chain, whether it's what you're receiving, what you're making, sending out, stuff that you need to get from your vendors. That whole process can get artificially magnified and we need to avoid that. So how can we reduce the bullet effect in our business? Let's look at it from three simple ways, even though it's not always simple. First, your data. If we're looking at the information we have on hand of how much is selling, what customers are buying, and what that purchase history has been, we can kind of glean an idea of what might be seasonal in our purchasing and what we need to buy and sell and what just might be a rising trend. And we can look back and see what our own purchases have been and what our customers have been buying. That gives us an idea of that kind of whip that can happen and what to plan for. With that, and it's kind of the same thing, forecasting, using that information, but also keeping track of the upcoming trends of both costs and availability of products that you might need to then make your product. If we can forecast, and not just one way, but like, you know, a, two to three scenarios, best, worst, and maybe middle ground of how our business could play out, we can plan for the unexpected. And this leads into the third point, which is alternatives. We need to be open to alternatives, whether it is a different type of part or product that goes into our assemblies and our bill of materials, or just another option that is more cost effective. We get better volume discount pricing from another vendor, whatever it is. We need to have a sense of what some possible alternatives are that if something comes along and we're not able to get the amount or the right product that we thought we should have, we can pivot and use something else. Because otherwise, once again, you're gonna have this bullwhip effect in your supply chain where now your customers are either not getting what they need and they're going somewhere else, or you're not looking ahead and seeing the problems and the headaches it's gonna cause for your inventory levels down the road. So make use of these little tips so that you can avoid the bullwhip effect in your business and then you won't have to deal with people and all their stuff that they might try to offer up to you. I'm James, this is Whiteboard Wednesday.